<clears throat> so I, since actually I thought about preparing a talk in contraposition to the text I wrote for that particular publication. And uh, I'm going to tell you the story of actually not just the last five years, but the last eight years. And I, I got very emotional today. Uh, I, I was like browsing pictures and pictures and pictures over the last years on all my hard drives. I have like 10 hard drives like this size, like piled up in a shoebox. And uh, one of the reasons I came late was because I, I couldn't let it go. So I was just like looking at picture after picture. And I, it was really hard to select some pictures. So I'm going to tell you a view on how electronics connect us to the world. And I'm going to start a bit low tech and then we go a bit high tech and then I go super low tech in the end of the talk and uh, I might even get, uh, I don't know, I think I have like 45 minutes, I might make two and a half hours instead. I hope you will cope with this and there is a lot of coffee at the back of the room. That is my job to say that you don't <laughs> go on forever, David, so okay, I will uh, break you down if you go. A shame. So I, I think people know me for being part of the Arduino platform, and I usually like to show this picture that is not exactly representative for the Arduino platform. It represents the five founding fathers, and uh, I have to say now I have also a founding mother, but she usually never comes to these meetings because someone has to keep the machine going. And then uh, when we took this picture at the old gate three about four years ago, she didn't happen to be there. And, you know, it's the one that that we use the most because we look as crazy as we can look, especially me. Uh, but uh, just to let you know, the person that is not in the picture is called Daniela Antonietti and uh, she's the CFO of the Arduino company nowadays. And there is Gianluca Martino, is our hardware expert, and Dave Mellis in the back, who is uh, our software architect. And then Tom Igo, that is responsible for documentation, and Massimo Vansi, who is CEO and I would say it's more like CTOs. It's more like looking at new technologies. And I'm responsible for dissemination, web strategy, and going super, going super low-fi with people. So, <clears throat> but my background is in interaction design. I, I graduated, I have a Master of Science in Telecommunications, and I worked making uh, or designing microchips in Germany for a short time, and I was project manager in Spain making huge radio installations for the police, firemen, et cetera, et cetera. And believe me, both tasks are equally boring. So at some point I was invited to come to Malmo University to teach the design students how to program, and I took that, that as, a, as a mission. And a couple of years later, I got a chance to start a PhD in interaction design that is like my life ongoing experience, which means after eight years I'm not really done yet, but I have some hopes for it. So yeah, I'm based at Bamboo University, and I'm a PhD candidate, and I'm a happy research fellow at the Media Studio, this place you're at right now. Being a research fellow means something like, do what you want, but come to the meetings. What translates in, okay, I come to the meetings I can, and I try to do what I want, but then, you know, there's papers to write, you know, things to fill in, and in the end, you spend 10% of the time doing what you want. But again, it's all about interaction design. I, I, when I make this kind of presentations, I tend to introduce to people which are my views on interaction design. And this is a statement that I made about eight years ago, and I can happily still stick to it. So at some point I will write the book and I will talk about my three statements. And I, I always say that interaction design has to deal with the creation of meaningful relationships between humans and artifacts. And I like to use this example here, which is the on-off button. I mean, if you look at that circle with that small stick in the center, it doesn't really mean anything. Well, now it means something, but 20 years ago it didn't really mean anything. And it became to mean something because somebody had the idea that, okay, that could represent this. And we created a relationship of meaning towards this icon. And interaction designers are responsible somehow to create that kind of meaning. Then there is a statical, aesthetic relationship between us and machines. I mean, it's very clear you love some devices and you hate some other devices and you l like how they look like and you like how the interface looks like and they make you feel good when you interact with them. And I, I like to take something as simple as an RSS feed icon. There is plenty of them to choose, but some of them will fit with you, with your character and with your website, and some of them won't fit. And you have to be good enough to figure out which is the good one. And then there is always a tension with technology. And I, I like to take the example of the mobile phone, 
And uh, you know, when, when I first saw a mobile phone back in 95 or 96 in Spain, it was because one of my best friends uh, was a son of uh, an executive member of uh, Telefonica. And he was lucky enough to have a free paid mobile phone. And he wanted to look cool, and he, were, he always carried his phone in his pocket, and he would put the phone on the desk in the cafe where we used to meet. And to me, that meant that he was always connected to work. He, ac he acted somehow as his dad's secretary. And uh, so he had to actually attend his dad's will. So he's like to, his dad would call and say, that uh, guy, when you come back home, you have to go to this uh, print shop and you know, get these photocopies for me, or you have to do this. Or... So he was kind of a slave of the mobile phone. And to me, and to many people, mobile phones represented work, and it was very antisocial to carry it with you. Nowadays, if you don't have a mobile phone, you are kind of a jerk. You can talk to anybody, you can post where you are, you can say what you're doing. And that tension with technology is what offers an opportunity for designers to look into the future. So again, talking about interaction design, the question pops up the whole time. Can one, how can we connect the physical world to the digital one? You know, it's, this is the question that came to me a long time ago. And back in 2004, we started to experiment with this, and we did things like this here, which is an interactive confession booth. This interactive confession booth, I'm not going to enter in which technology was used to build this thing, but it, it, it seemed to be very real. Now, these guys would enter, yeah, when you would enter the confession booth, and then a sensor would detect you were inside, it would tell you, would you mind closing the door? And you close the door. Could you kneel down? And then there's a red pillow, so you could kneel down. And the, the priest would start to ask you, okay, how do you feel? Confess your sins. And you would start talking, and you would hear this <coughs> voice going on as if it was listening, you know, the classic <gasps> in Swedish. And um, after like 35 seconds or so, the machine would say, thank you and would make a rewinding sound. And then you would understand you were in front of a machine. This was not real in any way. But it really, really gave you the feeling that it was real. So we took this piece and we, we brought it to Gothenburg Science Fair. And the students were lucky enough that TV got very interested in the piece. And it's then when I, when I realized that, I mean, we were doing these experiments to try to figure out how digital technology could, could be approached by designers. But when we put this object in front of thousands of people, you know, at Nordstein in this mall in Gothenburg, and it came on TV and we started to get phone calls from the press and the radio wanted to interview the guys, you know, I thought it was going to be like, it's a disaster. They're going to they're gonna say we're committing blasphemy here. Instead, a Catholic guy entered this device and said, yeah, this is very much how it is for real. And, and uh, then it became like, you know, okay, so we can actually try to learn about technology this way. We can make devices that emulate real life and we can see how people connect to them and so on. This was another device called the annoying chair. And basically, when you were passing by the chair, it would tell you, hey, don't you want to sit on me? I'm cozy. And they will sit on it. It would start like, oh, it's nice. Mm. Uh, can you move it to the right? Yeah, now I'm getting warm. And after a couple of uh, seconds, we we'll start telling you, you know, your ass is a little bit fat. It's like, wouldn't you mind like standing up a bit? And after some, some more time, we'd start telling you, you have to stand up. <laughs> and then you would stand up and we'd say like, no, don't go, don't go. It's like this kind of like a bit hysterical chair that couldn't decide whether she loved you or not. And just to, I mean, I love to show this picture here. Just so people can see how this thing was actually made. I mean, back in the days in 2004, we took a CD player and we recorded a lot of tracks in this CD player, in, this, in a CD, sorry. And we had like five tracks to invite you to come, uh, five tracks to tell you your, your ass was cozy, five tracks to tell you your ass was a bit heavy, and so on. And then we were randomizing the different sentences for different behaviors, and they would give you the feeling that there was a person in the chair. But yes, having all these different sentences properly randomized. And uh, well, I will come to that technique a bit later. Well, it, this is one of, this is a masterpiece. I have to say. This, uh, this uh, is one of my absolute favorites, and this was made again in the same batch of projects in 2004, 2005. And the idea behind this piece was to take control of the human body. And, and you will see this interface that would show you that, uh, oh, let's make it for real. There was a, a person, there was a person hanging from a chain and had electrodes in elbows and knees. 
the idea was that this person was going to dance to the music, but the issue was that uh, uh, if you get electroshock in both knees at the same time, you fall and it, it's painful. So we had to hang this person from the, from the ceiling with a chain. And, uh, and then it looked like we were basically frying a, a, a piece of meat, essentially. So you had this guy hanging like this, and uh, you will see on the screen that he was getting an electroshock in an arm if the sound reached a certain level. And uh, then you see that his arm would like, Froop. it was beautiful. As a matter of fact, I want to show you a video. I will show you a video later. You will see, you will see. But the, the problem we had, I mean, the thing with, with interaction design and prototypes is that sometimes you just want to give people the feeling that they work. This thing didn't really work the first time we showed, we showed it to people. So we had to make a small joystick. This is a picture. This is the Vaseline you need to use, the conductive gel, so that there is a proper contact between the electrode and your skin. This is a circuit with the power control to electroshock you. This goes to a computer, but the connection to the computer didn't really work. And it didn't work because it broke 10 minutes before the show. So we made this joystick. And the different buttons were representing elbows and knees. And there was this guy sitting in a box. Nobody could see him looking at the screen. And he saw arm, arm, knee, knee, arm, arm, knee, knee. So can you imagine the feeling of knowing that you're frying your classmate? I mean, that's, that was kind of the situation in this case. But for people, it was happening to the music. But for real, there was this guy like, yeah. And interesting thing is that we realized at some point that this could also be interesting as a, as a machine for, for learning about your body. So we, we make smaller prototypes. Uh, and I want to show you a small video that someone in the audience here might remember. And this video shows a machine that is just a small, small box with a small button where you can electroshock yourself. <laughs> uh, it's very noisy because this happened in a it formed a design center in Malmo. <laughs> and then yeah, he was experimenting with handshaking. <laughs> well, I have to say we, we tried a very nice business model in those boxes. The idea was that we we're gonna make eight. And the first is going to cost 100, the second is going to cost 200, the next is going to cost 400, the next 800. And uh, the students told me they sold some of them. I didn't see any of the money, unfortunately. But you know how this is. You get the fame, but not the cash. So again, this has to do with interaction design. But in order to build all these things for real, we need to think about tools. Now, the thing is that people tend to say, like, don't talk to our, our tools. You know, tools are not important. They say, like, no. Why tools? I would say, well, you know, in the, same way that a, that in the same way that a carpenter, when he builds a chair, he needs to understand how the hammer works. If you want to work with digital technology, you need to understand how digital technology works. And this was one of the main issues I was facing when we were making this place we saw before. The tools were really, really expensive, to the point that we could only afford five kits, five sets paid by the university for 60 students in a class with what, in my opinion, is ridiculous. I mean, just think that we had to have the kids working in groups of 12. Who is learning something? The guy typing and his best friend that is taking some notes. And the other 10 in the group are like <whistles> So I was really concerned about getting some tools that could, that could you know, improve the learning experience, because it's all about interaction design. So nowadays, when you think about tools, you think mostly about tools like this. You know. Interaction design, there is something that is very relevant, that is about multi-touch, and you deal with you know, creating software for multi-touch screens. You know, the iPad is the most sold computer nowadays. Until last year, it was Commodore 64, and I was really proud of that. iPad broke that record. And the other thing is Kinect, which is, you know, let's say, a device-less interaction device. It sounds really strange. It's, device -less, it's like it's filming you, you interact with it, but you're not really touching it. So you don't need to wear anything. You can be yourself at full blast. And the thing will detect what you're doing. It's like whole 9,000. So, but when we started seven years ago, our main concern was that we needed the students to have something they could work with. And that was what we created when we made Arduino. We just created a platform that would allow every student to own a device to learn about digital, about the digital world, and how to connect 
the physical environment to the digital world. And of course, there existed other things before Arduino. They were just damn expensive or really hard to approach. It was really hard to start coding for them. It was really hard to get sensors and connect them and so on. So what we did was just to simplify that. And our, our trick was very simple. We said, when companies manufacture stuff, they just look at this and how they can profit from the, bun the bundle of a piece of hardware and a piece of software and a piece of documentation. We said, I mean, after we have made the software, uh, how much does it cost for real? After you've made it, it doesn't cost anything. You know, it's just distributing it. It's just keeping a server. Keeping a server costs from $5 a month to, you know, whatever you want to pay. Then documentation is the same thing. From the moment you have created the documentation, how much do you need to pay, you know, as the creator to keep it? Nothing. Once it's done, it's done. So if somebody was paying us to make this thing, why should we be paid for it? That was our main concern at that point. So the only place or the only part that still needs to be paid for is the silicon, is the bakelite, is the plastic, and is the metal that composes the mix part or is part of a circuit. So we said, okay, let's make this thing cost the same thing as a book. Let's give everything, give everything else for free. And what happened is that people started to subscribe to this idea and we grew up a community of 70,000 users, as for today. You know, people just say, oh, it's great, I can download free software. I can actually make my own design, I can copy the board, because all the, all the things here are open source. The design is open source for the hardware, the software is uh, free software, and the documentation is Creative Commons. So you can just take everything, replicate the whole thing, and build your, even build your own business out of this and eventually get rich. We've seen this. <clears throat> so this generated a lot of buzz on the internet and made us become kind of well known. So we got a lot of friends that come to our website and download stuff, check the documentation, create projects, contribute back, send a lot of emails, hello, this doesn't work. Okay, did you plug the USB cable to the computer, my friend? That's, this is the kind of things you have to do when you want to build these communities. The thing is that we had a different touch than other communities. We understood that our average user was going to be, for example, an art student with no previous knowledge in software, or a teenager that he got a present from his dad and he was going to sit there and try the thing out to see if he could you know, read a sensor or build a robot or something like that. So we made no difference. We don't look at people's ages. We don't look at people's, at people's gender. We don't look at where they come from. When they ask, this is not starting up, then the question is, do you plug in the USB cable? You know? And not getting tired of asking that question is key. So <clears throat> I, I'm always fascinated about this graph here, which is uh, one of my results made as research fellow in here, which is try to map which is the world distribution of users. And if you look at how the Arduino users are distributed by country, you end up that the US has everything and it's really, really boring. But if you group up things by continent, then the picture is really different. Europe gets 50, uh, sorry, 46% of the share, and the US gets 41% of the share. But you see this line here is what really makes it very interesting. Is in 2008, something happened that made the Europeans become aware of this open source hardware in general, not just about Arduino, but in general. And it was an article on the American press where they depicted three terrorists they were talking about the idea of creating hardware where everybody could just copy it and could create their own thing on top and they wouldn't have to pay a fee back or anything. And this article came out in, I think it's November 2008. So you get the idea. We were interviewed in March 2008. It takes six months for the US press to you know, confirm everything. So it's, they really, when they write an article, it's because they're making history. So it's like, they call us separately after making the article to confirm that everything was right. They call our sources to confirm that everything was right. So it came out in November. Then all the European press read this thing. They wrote about it in uh, December 2008. And in January 2009, boom, this happened. Europe woke up in a month, just like that. What shows that there is an interest all over the world in these kind of things. It just needs to be... Uh, uh, communicated that there are tools to do these things. 
So we, we made a survey. This is actually results from a survey. We made a survey that it, it was answered by 7,800 people in less than two weeks to ask where people were coming from. And they told us, well, we're mostly coming from the US, but you see here, Germany, Italy, United Kingdom, I will jump over these other guys, Spain, the Netherlands, France. You know, all these people were also interested in prototyping. They were also interested in our platform. So we actually were able of making a profile of the average Arduino user. And it was male, it was between 20 and 40, is interested in technology, is using Windows. 70% of our users are using Windows. And I think the reason for that is most of our, most of our users are working at, or are learning at universities where they have computer rooms, where people are using Windows computers that in the end are cheaper than other computers. Uh, they have no prior experience in digital electronics, but they usually know something about software. So we realized this was great for software engineers and computer scientists to get introduced to go physical with digital technology. It's like they learn it in theory at the university, but they never got a chance to get hands on. And suddenly this opened up a possibility for them. And they had an internet connection because this was an online survey. So everybody, 100% of the users had internet connection. <laughs> and we realized that they really, really like Google. Uh, because when we asked them, how do you access our website? They say, I go to Google and I write Arduino Motor. And then they end up with our website. They don't go to our website. I mean, we have our own search engine, but why should you use my search engine when you have Google? It's omnipresent and can give you ads as well. So uh, I said the internet thing because I will come back to the internet later on. But uh, I, I want to show you a couple of projects made over the years, the ones that I find really relevant because they, they really, they say it really touched me. And I was somehow involved in making them. So Daniel Palacios is an artist from Spain and, and I met him, I mean, once I was teaching this workshop in Barcelona in January 2006, and it happened that uh, there, were not, there was not enough room for all the applicants. I said, I will not teach any more than 20 people. I had had a workshop in October 2005 for in theory, 20 people. The second day was 30 people. The next day was 50 people. And after 10 days, I had like 57 people going strong. And I was like exhausted. I lost five kilos. And so I said like no more than 20 people in my workshops, please. And uh, so what happened here in Barcelona was that I said, okay, I cannot attend more than 20. But if you find another venue, we will go to the other venue in the nights. So they found me a squat. And we had another 11 people coming every night. And they were all squatters and hackers with Linux computers. And I tell you, that was an experience. Because all of them had different computers, different Linux versions, and it was a royal pain in the ass. I mean, I had Linux myself, but the thing worked in my computer, but it didn't work in any of the other 11 computers. So Daniel was one of those. And uh, he, he was very interested in, in making sculpture. He had, studied, he had been studying arts, and he wanted to make sculpture, interactive sculpture. And he had this concept of uh, building something that could represent stationary waves with a rope. So what you see here is just a single rope, elastic rope, and it's five meters long. And he rotates on both sides and makes uh, physical shapes. And no matter how quick your camera is photographing this thing, you will always get some sort of 3D shape on it. And you can look at it for hours. So I had him in that workshop that was five days long. And he learned something that I met him some months later. Uh, and he came with like these two big motors and the rope and he said, okay, I want to start building this thing. And I said, you know what? I have like no clue about mechanics. I mean, I have never seen a hammer in my life. You know, it's like, if you can cut and paste, I can do code. And he said, no, no, I will build it. And then you will teach me how to code. And I taught him how to code and he built the thing himself. And he was showing this piece. He made it in 2006 and he was shown at the Taipei, I'm uh, sorry, it was not Taipei, it was Shanghai Olympics, or Beijing Olympics, Beijing Olympics, sorry, it's somewhere in China. I mean, I don't know, we're in Sweden, we are less than a city in China, so. So this is <clears throat> another relevant project, uh, mostly because Melvin Oxman, the student that made this project, he, he was an architecture student from Köln, and came to Malmo, and he was a bit lost, he didn't really know what to do, and he ended up in our lab, and he was like, oh, I want to build this kind of interactive things. And we helped him to get, getting hooked with technology. And he made this virtual reality helmet, I like to call it. But for real, it's based on this uh, effect called the PIF effect, where if you have two dots of light really close to each other 
and then you fade one out while you fade the other one in, it looks like a single blob of light moving. So he made this kind of like glasses. Oh, it was a huge helmet where the sound around you was translated into visuals and the distance to objects was translated into sound. So it was completely, you know, getting you nuts. It was crossing your senses. And this was his first prototype. He made this thing in a week. You know, it's like... Then we started to see a lot of robots coming in. As soon as you have electronics, for some reason, people want to build robots. And I have always been saying I hate robots. I, I had a series of lectures at the University of California in 2007 where I went to six different campuses where my first slide said, I hate robots. Because my point was that within interaction design, robotics doesn't really play a big role. There is a lot, thing, there is a lot of things to be done with digital technology that are not robots. Again, I had to eat my words later on. But this project made in 2005 by somebody that identified himself, himself as fallen, coming from China, was a robot that he made as part of his mechanics class. And uh, he basically had to, he had to create the intelligence for it. And he sent us an email saying, I would like to build the intelligence for my robot. And in 2005, I have to say, there was no Arduino distribution or so ever. You know, we made 300 boards. Malmo University had 150. The Ibrea Design School had 150. So this guy contacted, contacted me because we had a website where it, that said, this is open source, make it yourself, get the software here and go wild. And then uh, he said, hello, Mr. David. I am contacting you because I have to build this robot for my class and I'm forced to use an 8051 processor that was made, you know, before I was born. And, uh, and I, I, I said, oh, I'm pitying you, I'm pitying you, guy. And he said, like, yeah, but I would like to use an Arduino board. Could I buy one? I was like, look, the Arduino board costs 15 euros in parts. So it's more expensive for me to ship you one. It costs more money to put the, the parts in an envelope and ship them to China than to make it yourself. So I was, I was like inviting him to replicate it. And he was like, but how can I make a circuit? So I looked for references and explained how to make a circuit. I redesigned the board so that he could etch it in his toilet home. And 24 hours later, he sends me this picture of his board working. So I said, okay, now K3 is gonna pay for a free board for you. So I took the board, all the parts, put them in an envelope, brought it to the janitor and told him like, would you mind shipping this to China? And usually the janitor doesn't complain. Oh, China, of course in the post box. So then the guy sent me these pictures of his new robot. And I have some videos, I will not show them today, but you know, this robot moves for real. It's just amazing. So when I was showing these robots in Spain, this high school teacher said like, you know what? I'm making robots with my kids at the high school. And Arduino is perfect. So here you see an Arduino board up here. But the thing is that, you know, the average, the average high school in Spain has 300 euros a year for materials, for electronics in a lab. So this teacher was buying the Arduino boards himself and letting the school buy these white boards, these red boards, and the small components. And they were building the robots out of leftovers, like this comes from a deodorant, you know, the ball. So he was making these robots with his kids at the, at the high school. And actually this robot made it to the cover, I don't know if you're familiar with the Sonar Festival, the music festival in Barcelona. Well, this robot was the cover of one of the booklets of the Sonar Festival 2006. Nothing to do with music, but it made it to the music world, which is kind of cool. Uh, JC is still, is still teaching with the same boards he got uh, six years ago. You know, he made an investment six years ago and he still reuses them every year with his students. Last year, we got this guy, uh, Sebastian, that actually won a prize. He is 14 and he made this internet connected object that is made with an Arduino board as well that detects earthquakes and tweets about the earthquake. You know, this, there's this typical earthquake alarm or typical in Sweden, we don't have them, of course. I mean, but in Chile, they do have these things that they can predict with some minutes or seconds that there's gonna be an earthquake. They can detect the vibrations and they can beep and inform you. So he had this thing and just using this Arduino board with an internet connection, he's pinging on the internet. Hey, there's an earthquake coming. Come on guys, leave the house. So he got 32,000 followers on Twitter in like no time. Because everybody wanted to know that there was an earthquake. I, I have no pictures of this, but you know, during the Fukushima uh, radiation issues in Japan, a lot of people started to design Arduino-based devices that were 
informing about the radiation levels by their apartments. So they got radiation maps of the neighborhoods so that they would know whether it was suitable to leave the apartment or not. And again, it allowed people to buy themselves, just buy parts, put them together, and inform about radiation levels. It became so critical that for about a month, there were no radiation meters in the whole world. It was impossible to buy radiation meters. <clears throat> so at some point, I had to confront my fears, and I had to make a robot. I was teaching electronics at a small school in Mexico City. And I was teaching the kids how to make music instruments, how to control buttons, how to you know, play music and make small games on the computer and then control them with circuit boards. And I asked them, OK, what do you want to do next? And they told me, we want to make robots. And I was like, no. Yeah. So I left them for a couple of minutes. I asked, oh, so guys, what do you want to do again? Robots, OK. So I ended up making robots. But my issue was that it had to be robots they could actually make in Mexico. So I went out on the streets. I went to the electronic stores. I mean, Mexico is a pretty big country. has one of the biggest universities in the world with 95,000 people on campus and 200,000 people online. So there has to be some electronic store somewhere. I thought. And uh, yeah, you can buy stereos, of course. You can really buy parts. So uh, I look for parts, and I, everything you see here is found in Mexico. And uh, the robots are made with, I think I have a bigger picture here, as inexpensive as possible. They have a ping pong ball in the back instead of a back wheel. These wheels are printed and made in Mexico. Uh, the motors, they cost like something in the range of one and a half dollars, and so on. So the final robots, they can completely be manufactured by these people. So I, I made this design, and I helped them implementing uh, 15 of them, together with Shun Yan, by the way, that was a student at the Interaction Design Program here, who was responsible for most of the software. And then we uh, put these robots out, and now they, these people are manufacturing the robots and teaching other people how to make the robots, and they're expanding they are already in uh, Mexico in two different locations and in Panama. And I think there are plans to make them at more places. <clears throat> so yeah, the concept behind the open source robot is essentially that you can share the creation with others and it helps you learning about the world. This is where I learn. Where I learn is that robotics are very relevant to call the kids' attention about the world of electronics and programming. You know, even if they're not appealing to me at all, they can be appealing to other people. And I had to make a compromise as a designer, because in the end, I'm an interaction designer, and create something for my group of users, in this case, these kids. And I had to let it go and learn with them. And I can tell you, learn a lot. This is a, how we were, are etching the circuits. It's everything you need to etch a circuit in Mexico. So you need boards, and you have to make the the prints like this, and then you have to use acid, and then you have to solder, and then you have to drink a lot of Coca-Cola because it's cheaper than water, and so on. And there is three liter Coke bottles. So if you are keen on Coke, move to Mexico. And this provoked a lot of reactions. Suddenly I was approached by the world champions in robotic soccer. that happened to be two teenagers from Spain. It's like four times champions. And uh, so we started to discuss about their robots. And the robots, as you see, they're also using Arduino boards. And they use multiple Arduino boards, as many as five Arduino boards in one robot. So these kids that have been winning four years in a row, they build robots with distributed intelligence. Let's put it with technical words. They make robots with distributed intelligence. And uh, when they won the first time, she was 13 and he was 12. You know, beat that if you can. I, I can't. At the time, I was just breaking my computer when I was 12. And uh, well, the thing is that we came to the idea of designing an open source robot by designed by them instead of designed by me. And I became the manufacturing engineer. So they will make blueprints. They will come to me. I will look at them, discuss with, actually with the factory to see, OK, how can this thing be made? And they will tell me, OK, this is not like this, is not like that, this does, doesn't work. And we have to print this plastic, and we have to do this other thing, and send it back to the kids. And, you know, so the kids are responsible for creating the educational content, so you get the picture. And I'm just an intermediator. And we're going to get this manufactured, and now we are making the book of exercises. And it's made by these two kids. One, he is now 
uh, 16 and she's 17. You know, he's at the last year of high school and she's at the first year of university. <clears throat> but the question is, what happens when I am offline? This is really the issue. Everything I told you now is about when you are online. And as I said, that booklet that we are presenting today is about being online, creating things for being online. But I've been confronted several times with, with being offline. So last week, I actually went, or last week I returned from Mexico, where I'm working in a project that is called, or with a project at a place called Cegache. Cegache is, is a village. No, no, not yet, no. Cegache is a village that is, uh, oh, I should probably stop the animation. Okay, I can have it running. And we're working with this workshop of people that are carpenters and are experts in making those mirrors that you saw one picture ago, those that you see on the wall. The way they work is that they, they invite one artist, this is how they survive. They invite one artist, this artist takes their basic design, which is one of these mirrors, and then he you know, makes something out of that mirror and they are allowed to make five replicas of that mirror and then they sell these mirrors for about 300 euros the piece. And with those mirrors, which is five times 300 euros, every couple of months, they pay for 16 families. You know, that's, that's how it works there. So when I came there, my goal was to teach these people a bit about electronics and learn about what they do there and see if we could do anything together. So what I did during the last three weeks was to work with, imagine, programming that is in English with people that have one computer for everybody with no internet. When we mentioned internet, five people didn't know what it was directly. Some people didn't know how to type. You know, I mean, the class would go like one third of the speed of how it goes in a normal class here because people just can't interact with the machines. But you know, what amazes me is that in a week we had much better results that we have at the first year bachelor at Malmo University. And as I, as I will show you. I mean, sorry to say for the bachelor students, but. <clears throat> and of course, I could tell you about the personal story of everybody. I mean, it's of course very touching. I mean, I've been confronting situations like this one several times. It's not the first time I go on a workshop with people that have no internet or, you know, that live in a poor neighborhood or whatever. Like Jose, for example, he lived for uh, seven years as a child in the United States, and then his family was forced to return. So imagine you've been living, having more or less everything, going to school, and he's a Taekwondo master. He's U.S. master and champion in Taekwondo. But then he has to live in this small village outside anywhere, you know, without an internet connection. And on the other hand, you have people like Doña Pau that is over 50 years old, and I discovered her one day going into a computer, opening a Word document, and trying to do copy-paste, because I explained them that copy-paste was key in learning how to program. So she would write something on the computer and do control set, control V. And I was, what are you doing? And the thing is that in Spanish, from Spain, control C is copy, right? But in, in Spanish from Mexico, it's control C. And control Z is control C. Uh, set, sorry. So she completely misunderstood me. So she was undoing pasting, undoing pasting, undoing pasting. So these are the projects that they did in two days. You know, we did three days where I explained them basics about turning on and off lights, pressing buttons, rearing analog sensors. I mean, we couldn't connect these things to the internet because there was no internet. So, and the concept of internet doesn't really exist, of course. But uh, we could build these things up or they could build these things up in no time because that's their craft. So, you know, it's like if you go to the cases workshop here and you want to build something like this and you have a piece of wood that is this thin, you say, okay, there is no wood to build it. I can't build it. Okay, they will take the wood, cut it in pieces, glue it together like this and make the wood in the size they need it. That's how they understand wood. In the same way that we do copy-paste, they do copy-paste physically, of course. So they could construct all these things in no time. Oh, I love this one, by the way. Uh, this is a mirror that has the same technique as that chair, the annoying chair we saw earlier. But what it does is that when you sit in front of a distance sensor, when you stand in front of the mirror, it's going to give you nasty compliments. 
you know, like, ooh, nice ass, baby, things like that. And uh, I think these are, okay, this one is a bit wide, but what you see always in this documentation first is a sketch of their idea. Like, for example, this is a tray that we use to celebrate the end of the workshop. And this is a game. It has one button and one potentiometer, a bunch of lights, and a bit of sound. And when you press the button and the, light, the lights down here are blinking in red, let me see if I can stop this so I can tell you the story. No. Escape. Image. View. I think I stopped it, right? Yeah, I did. Okay. So when you press the button and the light is here in red, that means you win the game. If you win the game, you are allowed to say who is going to drink. You know, everybody sits around the table and you have a mezcal glass on top of the tray and you say who is drinking this thing in a sip. Mezcal is a traditional drink made of cactus and uh, has over 45 percentage in alcohol. And I had to drink seven of them and they had to drive me home. Uh, but the workshop was over, so it was okay, I guess. But uh, the idea again is that they, I mean, here we mix a lot of things. That game is a Spanish game. They don't do that thing. They don't drink like that. But I didn't know it was that hard with alcohol. But uh, my absolute favorite project is this one. It was actually made by this Jose guy, which is a music box. And this music box is, uh, again, an example of collaboration between many different things. First of all, it includes an algorithm made by the Danish guy that responds to the name of Diesel, and uh, that has been used by our research studio before to play sound. So this thing will go on and will play sound. Let's, let's leave full screen and see if it stops moving so you can get the picture. Yeah. So the idea is that when you press the buttons, the, the, the lights will start shining and they will introduce different lines of the bass or the, of the drums or whatever. So that's the documentation for this. No, like this. So this shows that even when you're offline, you can actually get to do a lot of things, which got me to think about what is actually important. Because I've been obsessed for the last three years that everything has to be existing in Spanish. You know, I, I think I told you a couple of times already now, I am from Spain. And uh, I speak Spanish much better than I speak English, which is a relief. And uh, the thing that I learned is that I was obsessed that people would need all this documentation written in Spanish. And it's kind of important when, actually when you are online, because you can get the chance to learn by yourself. But if you are offline, you're going to need someone to tell you a story. You know, for these people, connecting to the internet for one hour is the money that I mean, it costs 10 pesos, but with 10 pesos, their family eats for a whole day. So they will not go online for one hour. That's why they don't understand the concept of internet. When we were going to the internet to blog stuff about the project, we were paying for the internet. So that they could, you know, 10 pesos is very inexpensive. 10 pesos is less than $1. 16 pesos is $1 for one hour. You know, you could perfectly afford to spend three or four hours on the internet a day. And that was available in the village. But they would never do that because it was too much for them. So this whole idea of creating this documentation and putting it online so people can learn by themselves doesn't apply. All of a sudden, it doesn't apply. You know, you need to actually think in a different way, and you need to package all this information in a different way so that it's available for these people. Arduino right now has 700 documents in English. 700 documents are pretty long with examples of code, etc., etc. But, you know, in a place where electricity is at scarce, which is like people turn off the lights because it costs too much money, you know, where there is no computers and so on. I mean, you can't really give them a 700 pages document. It's not 700 pages, 700 documents is probably like over 2,000 pages for them to learn anything because they're not going to stay there at night because they're going to turn off the lights and go to sleep, you know. So you need to think about the whole education in a completely different way. That's the main conclusion I got over the last weeks. Yeah, it got me to think in different colors, I have to say. <laughs> so uh, this is everything I had to tell you. I mean, the story of Arduino, as I said, shows up as a need, as an answer to a need to get tools for 
education. And when we created this thing, we are moving more and more in the, let's say, first world into getting more connected, doing better things, and we get other platforms that compete with Arduino that are just trying to get connected and bring everybody online and design new things. But by doing that, we should not forget about the other part of the equation, that is people that you know, can't really afford the internet. So the question to me is, how can we educate about digital to people that also have digital, but that can't get the same kind of access we are getting? So thank you very much. Cool, David. Thank you very much. Did I make it um, I think I was given the t task to sort of uh, start off with, with asking questions to David, but it's absolutely up to everybody in the audience as well to raise your hands and, you know, give questions to to David on, on any topic that you like. Um, so, but you need a mic, otherwise we won't have it on tape afterwards. So, raise your hands and I will run around. But I will start asking David. With all the with all the the different kinds of projects that you show, everything from the waved sculpture until everything, what role did Arduino play in all of them? Okay, I mean Arduino was a component in all the projects that I showed after two thousand and five. Mm. It was there. Arduino as the Arduino entity. I mean, we have had a distributed way of responding to users, so it's like. I've been traveling the world, helping people out. So my role in that sculpture was to educate this guy so he was self-sustainable, I mean, self uh, sustainable, so to say. So he could do the thing himself. So he doesn't contact me to ask me uh, how to program this. No, that's not an issue any longer. You know, and that's been my role more or less in every project. But how, uh, how important is the tool? How important oh, no, is the board? I mean, without the tool, they wouldn't have had the chance to make it. It's like the Waves art piece. As an art piece, it costs 100 euros in total, all the parts. And this, this guy couldn't afford like a 1,000 euros prototyping platform. I mean, so, so that's key, actually. Because the, the issue before Arduino is that you had to pay for, this, for the hardware that could cost whatever. Usually they were more expensive than a laptop. You had to pay for a license for the software. You had to get documentation that were usually books that usually cost 30, 40 euros. And many times you had to go to a course from the company making the chip so you could actually learn something. So that it's been, it has been key that we put all these things available for free so people could learn. And also it has generated a very healthy ecosystem where people compete to provide better documentation. People try, they, there is a lot of different books on Arduino. Uh, people keep on making new books, trying to give you a better entry into the platform, which in the end influences all, also our own content. And, and uh, I mean, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with this other platform called Raspberry Pi that was just launched now, that's an inexpensive computer that's gonna cost $35 or $45. Well, for example, if you want to develop something for the microcontroller on the Raspberry Pi, you need to sign an NDA with the company making the chip. So in that way, it makes it impossible, you know, to start developing a board like that one. You cannot, let's say, compete. You cannot play the same game because you need to reach a certain volume before you can sign an NDA with a company to get the data sheet to a microchip. So, so I, think, I think it's a very re relevant statement in the sense that, especially for me as well, because it's something that I have been working a lot with during the last five years as well, just to see if you can lower the cost of the technology, what it actually do to people, and what people actually can do with the technology if it's cheap enough, and it sort of becomes a marginal cost of what it normally cost them mm -hmm. to do. How, how do you feel that the, the Arduino board is, is coming around with that? How, so how... Mean, like lowering the price? Yeah. I mean, okay, the strategy we had until now is that, well, we will keep on having, it's like we, we set a fixed price. So it's like an Arduino board should cost the user 20, dollar, uh, 20 euros, sorry, without VAT, uh, no matter where, where about in the world. But, on top of that, we made a positive discrimination towards Latin America, for example, where it's sold without margin. Uh, the strategy that Arduino does, what Arduino does actually, Arduino doesn't manufacture anything, I have to say this, Arduino only creates IP. So what we do is that we sit in front of the design uh, board and we create a new board, we create new software for it, we create documentation, and then we license manufacturing to somebody. 
And then somebody manufactures this thing and they pay a 10% fee on their sales to the Arduino organization so we can maintain our website, pay our flying tickets to meetings and things like that. So that's, that's the way everything works for us. Uh, so by setting a price, we are putting everybody in a compromise because you actually need to reach volume as a manufacturer before you can make profit. Because if we say this work costs 20, but I know that manufacturing a board, this kind of work is going to cost you between 16 and 17, and you need to reach tens of thousands before you can actually go down to like 14 and, and start having a reasonable margin and start making some money. So what we did was kind of like put everybody under pressure. But what happened is that some people saw a business in that because they could sell things on top of Arduino boards. They could sell cables, they could sell sensors, they could sell books, they could sell stickers, T-shirts, you know, anything that can go around it. So the tool is still inexpensive and you can get it for very little. You can also, because we also have documentation, make it yourself, make it on a breadboard and make it cost like $7, literally. But uh, uh, it's much less than the margin you have on other electronics. The margin on electronics is times two, usually. And so if I make it for 10, I sell it to the next part of the chain for 20, and to the final user it's gonna cost 40. So everybody can make discounts. In this case, the margin is much smaller. Also considering the, the sort of taking down production costs and everything, there is, as you're mentioning now, a lot of other vendors stepping in and taking over, and there is a, Google made their own version. Mm -hmm. uh, Telefo Telefonica has been helping you out lately. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that that is moving around? How is the, the world's ecosystem when it comes to electronics, you know, now tapping into what you have been doing and... Yeah, when we started, I mean, okay, if we want to talk, to talk about the future of electronics, you should all have this thing in mind. In like five years time, there's gonna be chips in the side of a nail that are gonna run a full Linux system. So that's reality. I mean, that's what Raspberry Pi is, for example. So that's gonna, it's gonna cost like $5 to put a full Linux computer into any design. So it's gonna be inexpensive. And we are not talking about far ahead in the future, no, we're talking tomorrow. So uh, when it comes to design, we can think about making a button that has a full Linux computer to, to when you press the button, it connects to the internet that sends something out. Right? And it's gonna be very, very cheap. So what we are concerned with from Arduino is that when, I mean, when we started, that's, this didn't exist. The vision was there, but nobody had been you know, making the silicon to make this happen. And uh, at the same time, Nobody had been thinking about infrastructure to connect things to the internet and so on. And what we've been doing is to, you know, fill in this space, helping people moving towards that vision. So what, what we are doing with companies now is try to help them to implement this vision, basically. What we do with Telefonica is to help them creating a core of people, building connected objects that are going to be able of helping them implementing this idea of how much did Ericsson say, 50 billion connected devices, right? That will never happen if there is not a lot of small designers making connected devices. And I don't know if you're familiar with the model, but how things have been working until now is that if you wanted to make something connected, you needed to be able to manufacture in 10,000. I want to make a, a lamp that connects to the internet. If you don't make 10,000, it's going to be very, very expensive. So we've been working with, with Telefonica and actually through Medea and actually through your collaboration and Alf's collaboration has been to talk to telcos and convince them that they should sell SIM cards very cheap. Uh, so that small producers could have SIM cards with data to get objects to connect to the internet. And we managed to do that, and that's what we announced two days ago in, in Barcelona, actually, that now through Arduino you can buy GPRS devices with SIM cards that you can preload with data, that you can then make a device and ship anywhere in the world, and you know they're gonna work as long as there is a GS GSM connection. You know, that's the, and that's, that's the issue with connectivity. You need to have a lot of designers coming out with ideas. And these big companies, they couldn't cope with that idea of smaller designers. They could call with Volvo buying 10,000 SIM cards, but not with David buying 20 SIM cards to make 20 alarm clocks and, you know, sell it in the market. That's, that, that was, that's always one of the problems of uh, digital. How to scale down so that small designers can make something and eventually come up with better ideas and eventually become bigger companies. Anyone from the crowd that's coming up with any questions? Sure. 
So thanks for your talk. Uh, you. It's interesting. I, I was wondering, as as a research fellow, mm -hmm. how much of what you do in your daily life is is science, and how much is art, <laughs> and and do those kinds of distinctions matter to you? Uh, well, okay, I I have to say uh, my research method is called action research, and uh, what it implies is I get involved with a community of users, and I go through the process of doing things with them, and then I have to step back and analyze whether what I did was right or wrong. So the science is made afterwards. So I go to this process, uh, this project in Mexico, for example, I spend uh, 12 work days with these people, uh, making these things, learning about their craft, learning about my craft, and now it's when I have to sit down and you know, try to make sense of what happened there. And uh, this is not hard science. You know, that's what happens with design is that it's not hard science. But to make it hard science, I should go out and make a survey to the 70,000 Arduino users and make sense of that. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. So I would say a lot of the time is preparing myself to this process, then make it happen being part of it, and then try to be you know, objective enough afterwards. And I, that part is really hard, because then you have to think like, oh, I really sucked in this thing. You know? <laughs> like, I really did this thing wrong. But I have made over 100 workshops, so I think that part is kind of covered. For example, when I went to this workshop in Mexico, my preparation was not so much what I was going to do there. You know, I was, for three days I was teaching people about digital electronics. I didn't prepare myself for that. I've been teaching this thing so many times. My only concern was how to say this in Spanish. <laughs> you know? But uh, I was more scared of, okay, what happens when I tell them, okay, now you guys take your, your hammer and let's build out something, you know? And, and there was a lot of group dynamics there. But uh, yeah. At the end of the day, the, the real research, so to say, happens afterwards, but everything counts in the process. More questions? There is someone. There's. Then I gotta run. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. I, I had a question more about the role of, let's say, teaching people to build things mm -hmm. with electronics. I mean, 70,000 Arduino users is fantastic, but on the other hand, as you said, the people in Mexico with no kind of comparative education to what you know bachelor students here have are creating better things. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about this kind of gap you know, that's called about the lack of using your hands in, in, in our part of the world? You know, and what role does Arduino have in teaching people to be tinkers if you want to go with the United States kind of concept? Mm -hmm. You know, a make magazine, this idea of how do we teach people to build things again? And what role does that play with Arduino, whether it's, you know, making connected devices or, or giving people kind of, you know, tangible skills? Well, I think, f first of all, I think I made a, a bit of a cheap comparison when I, when I compare this workshop in one week with the K3 students here. First of all, these people, they left everything they were doing to come to my class. Uh, uh, when we may teach the students at K3, they have other obligations, you know. So it's, it's a bit cheap to make that comparison. I just wanted to make it as a funny thing. But uh, also, these people, as you said, I mean, they're craftsmen. They do this thing the whole time. You know, they, they, they take a piece of wood and they transform it into a beautiful mirror with the Rococo style in 24 hours, and the day after they are gold plating this thing. You know, it's like, so we cannot expect those, our students here to have that skill. Uh, on the other hand, I believe that we are forgetting in Europe uh, a lot about the craft, the value of craft. That's something that O'Reilly identified very, very well, as you said, and created Make Magazine and created Craft Magazine. And they, they saw that there was a, an interest in society on on at least trying to do something with your hands and not depend on a company or a factory making this thing and allowing you to personalize things at your own will and so on. And what I was trying to show with this graph where I showed the comparison, the comparison between Europe and the US is that there's also an interest in Europe. Whether that interest happens within the universities or not is a different story. I mean, I believe that as academics, we need to start balancing skills with knowledge. I believe that if you want to be a good mechanical engineer, you need to build machines. You know, if you want to be a good designer, you need to go into the workshop and learn how to cut wood or metal or whatever you want to build. Yes, making models, like in 
foam, in my opinion, is not enough. You know, foam is not the final material of your phone if you're going to be making mobile phones. It's going to be plastic, it's going to be metal, it's going to be gorilla glass. You know, you need to go into the materials and learn them. Again, when, what I really was uh, struggling with in this workshop in Mexico was, a di was what we call the digital material here at Medea. It's the idea that there is something that is, you know, is information or is code or is whatever that can be used and reused. And it was really cool to try to explain people how to count in binary, for example. You know, the concept, I mean, it was beautiful when this 30-year-old woman, uh, suddenly I explained her like, okay, in, in the, in, as human beings, we have 10 symbols to count. One, two, I mean, I didn't start with zero, I started with, started with one, and when I made it to nine, I said zero. I was thinking in the keyboard in my head, right? And said, okay, after nine, we count 10. And I said, but computers, they're a bit more stupid than human beings, and they don't have two symbols. So you have zero, you have one, and after one, what comes? And everybody was like, puzzled. And suddenly this one woman said, 10. And everybody looked at her like, are you responding to the teacher? Are you answering? It's like, because in Mexico, this is like super strong respect to the teacher. It's like, I could have told these people to go clapping, I would have started clapping because of the respect to the teacher. So that was another issue. You know, as when, when I try to compare Sweden and Mexico, it's like, there is a lot, of, a lot more issues than the result. You know, the dynamics in the class also have to do with how people are, how they understand the, the image of the teacher and so on. It doesn't matter that I'm younger than half of them, I'm the teacher. So I'm, I'm standing on this pedestal, you know, and, and I had to break that as well, you know. But then this woman told me 10. And I said, okay, and after 10, 11. And after 11, another guy says 100. And suddenly everybody was counting in binary. They didn't know that 100 was number four, but they knew that 100 came after 11. They, they couldn't make the connection between natural numbers and binary numbers, but they knew how to count binary all of a sudden. So, interesting thing is that it's much harder to explain the same concept to Swedish kids. I don't know why. <laughs> you know. So, but, okay, my point is more that it's, it's hard to, I mean, there is, the whole comparison between the class is much more complex than that. I mean, maybe I should be more careful when I present this thing next time and I don't say like, oh, it's much better. It's much better from the craft's point of view. You saw those boxes. We, we brought these boxes directly into the shop where they sell the mirrors. So they, they will try to sell those boxes and we will see if we can manufacture more. You know, that's, that's the result of that. But they are, they are much more oriented towards, you know, the physical, obviously. While we are not, we are more into the concept. We, feel, we always think that somebody else will make it. And I think that's what we need to change. Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, and I, I only <laughs> exaggerated as well to, <laughs> to make the point. But I do think that, you know, in our society, we, we know, especially at university, we lack the skill making that, you know, that happens and happened in the past, especially with the studio education, although interaction design and other programs at, at Mama Hoke School are different, but certainly in computer science aspect, we lack, you know, we lack the skill making to some extent. You know, well, I, I believe, I mean, I can't tell you a story. Hmm. It's like some years ago, one of my students wanted to make a memory game, an interactive memory game. I had this idea I was going to made it be made in plexiglass, and I, I actually remember the whole story today when I was browsing all these pictures back from 2000 and, uh, 2005 and so on. And uh, they needed a CNC machine to, to craft this beautiful box in plexiglass and have all these small interactive cards that were going to be put in the different places. And the idea was that you would take one card and it would play one sound. A different card would play one sound. And if they didn't match, you had to put the cards back. So it was a sound-based memory game for blind kids. That was the concept. To make this box, to craft it, they came to this building because there was a really old technician that was running a very old CNC machine. You know, this guy was bored. He had nothing to do the whole day because nobody was requesting his skill. And as a matter of fact, one of the main problems is that from an economical point of view, it's not worth for the university to hire these kind of people. You know, K3 has one workshop technician and he's having hundreds of students every term. Hundreds of students, literally. So the problem we have is that in our educations, in our education programs, we don't value the, the craftsman enough. 
and and I think we need to change that, or this thing will never work. That's uh, that's my concern as well. Right. Thanks for asking, by the way. I could make a statement. <laughs> More questions? Not anyone. It's someone in the back there. Okay, good. Hi. Um, the thing is that I th uh, there are a lot of uh, discussion and polemics about, uh, for instance, all the Apple building all their stuff in China, mm -hmm. and from what they know, the Arduino boards are built in Italy. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about uh, if it you could? Can you see a, a trend on uh, companies uh, making the things? again in Europe or with uh, better labor conditions and mm -hmm. what implies to build electronics here rather than in, in China? Okay, when it comes to Arduino, I, I said we have 70,000 registered users, but there is over 430,000, I think, as for today, Arduino boards. And by the end of this year, I think we will, we will reach 800,000 probably. Um, the Arduino boards are manufactured by three different manufacturers right now. The main manufacturer is in Italy. He makes the Arduino Uno board, that is the one that sells the most by far, and it's exported to all, the whole world. Uh, he has just opened a manufacturing facility in Brazil. Um, uh, also, the, the other two manufacturers are from the US, but they manufacture in China, because it's a very nice agreement between the US and China. They pay like 2% import tax, which is an insult. We pay 20 something percent uh, import tax, even from China. So, that said, uh, this is something that all designers need to learn. You know, because everybody thinks, like, oh, I go to China and manufacture, it's going to be much cheaper. That is not true. If you are not making a million of anything, China is never cheaper. Because if you want to get something that is a bit special, a bit different, you need to be there supervising the manufacturing process. And then you need to figure out a factory that can manufacture your right size. Arduino is an open source uh, design, and as an open source design, it's open for changes. And people make suggestions, and sometimes they are taken into account, and that means they have to influence the design. So we cannot go and make a million boards. It would be great to, to raise some venture capital and go and make a million boards. But you know, there is modifications on the board every 30, 40, 50,000 boards, which means, in essence, that we need a small manufacturing facility where we can be making small batches of the product. And for most products, this is what applies. So it's not worth going to China. You know, it's essentially, essentially, that's the issue. It is not worth going to China. And uh, for electronics, that's the fact. So, make it, for example, SparkFunk, that is one of the Arduino manufacturers, he makes the circuit boards in China, but then he ships the circuit boards to the US and makes machine mounting in the US. Because otherwise, it's too expensive take the risk. That's, that's the case. Even book printing. Italy is also the cheapest place in Europe for book printing. Even some Mexicans, where you know printing books in Mexico is ridiculously cheap, they ship mid-sized productions to Italy before they send them to China. So it's, uh, the whole dynamic about how it works with money is, is very interesting. So when you bring money into the equation, you start looking at design in a different way. And this whole thing about made in China or manufacturing in China, you know, I, don't, I believe there is, it's possible to get good quality with fair manufacturing conditions in China. Is that that is not worth for us, or not for us, but for our manufacturers, because it means that they have to have a person there the whole time and you know, supervise the manufacturing process the whole time. I don't know if I answered the question, but I tried. <laughs> More questions? You can ask about software as well. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Sure. I don't know, it, it might be stupid. I'm not really good at electronics, but <laughs> uh, can, can you 3D print a circuit board? Uh, no, but you can CNC a circuit board. So you can use a, like 3D printers, they work in three dimensions, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to, to melt copper, <laughs> which is the conductor that is used for boards. But if you just have a two-dimensional 
3D printer with a mill, uh, you can actually put a, put a circuit board and mill away the leftovers. And this is a technique that is used mo uh, broadly in, in hackerspaces to make inexpensive uh, circuits. So, yeah. I mean, it's not really 3D printing, but let's say that you can do it. But you cannot really print the, you cannot really print the, the silicon. Okay, the, the chips, they need to be manufactured if we have, with a very specific process in white rooms and so on. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, I think it's time to wrap up then, David, and I think I'm going to end with a, with the last question just concerning of where Arduino is going. Mm -hmm. So when you do this talk in five years from now, <laughs> what has happened? Hopefully, uh, hopefully I have a villa in... Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I like to make the joke, but uh, I, I think there is two things that are going to happen. And uh, we have made already the announcement and we have designed a new board called Leonardo that is uh, really inexpensive and is really oriented towards these third world education markets. Uh, and we are really pushing towards manufacturers of silicon releasing our chips or the, their chips with our software inside so they can be, you know, it can be, uh, the people can just make the circuits for nothing at the place where they are at. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to the connected wor world, we are coming out with new designs that are going to be, ma be making much easier to you know, connect to the internet. Like we just released this one that works over GPRS that allows you making a design in Sweden, put a SIM card uh, of any company, close the design and ship it to the other corner of the world. And as long as there's a GPRS connection, the thing is going to work and it's going to be sending data and so on, and you don't have to care about it. You know, if it works here, it's going to work there. And that's, again, allowing this more connected world. And we're going to be moving towards more and more small computers, and we'll come up with a Linux computer uh, with Ethernet connection and Wi-Fi connection, pe people to start prototyping things. And you can only expect that we will make easier to code, and we will make easier uh, you know, to create new objects, and as cheap as it goes, that's the plan. <laughs> So in five years' time, hopefully, you will have a sensor board or sensor box home that will be Arduino. Cool. Yep. Thank you very much for Thank your time. You. Give him a hand.